All right. Well, I'm, I'm Christine, and I have been a CISO for 526 days. Thank you. And um, coincidentally, I think this is also the time frame when most of the white hairs in my, hair, my head have appeared, not that I have before and after pictures. But this job is interesting, to say the least. I have been working in the cybersecurity industry for the past 20 years, and only a year and a half of that as a CISO, and I feel like I have changed my religion. I used to be preaching that uh, patch your vulnerabilities. And as a CISO, I would say, yeah, if only I can patch them all. Reduce your attack surface. In a growth company, may not be that easy. Understand your assets. Mm, yesterday, I understood them better. Today, there might be something new. Understand your third-party risks. And I guess this is a time when CISOs try to find a happy place in their head. In my experience, building cybersecurity products and services is an entirely different animal than cybersecurity practice. Because in cybersecurity practice, all the absolutes go out of the window. And I realized this is why they call this risk management. But the thing with this as well, this role, is that this is also the place where you can rejoice in small incremental improvements. And you become really good at filtering out opinions that don't really make a difference, as well as choosing which battles to fight. And we all know that Aziz's life is full of stressors, but sometimes it may not be the stress that we imagine. We talk about battles, we talk about major incidents, or perhaps even a cybersecurity crisis in an organization. And sure, those are stressful times for a CISO, but they're sort of like one-off, short-lived stress. And the really good thing about this time is that you have the full support of the organization behind you because they would like you to resolve the crisis faster. And even better, after the crisis is resolved, then you get support for all the initiatives that you're having in order to make sure that that doesn't happen again. But peacetime, peacetime is interesting because it's also quite a stressful time for a CISO, but not quite the spiked adrenaline rush kind of stress, but more of the insidious, prolonged stress that you can't quite get away from. There's continuous pressure. Pressure to make sure that you have reduced your incidents so that a compromise will not happen in your organization. Pressure to test your disaster recovery plans, or maybe have you made enough disaster recovery plans? So just in case a compromise happens, then your organization can recover quickly. There's even pressure from regulations, pressure from customers, who are feeling the same pressure as well. Pressure as well from senior management, for instance, because when they talk to their peers and their peers experience a breach, then they feel pressured. And of course, they delegate the pressure to you because that's your job. And we get pressure from all these scenarios and hypotheticals, and we plug them into our cyber risk management program. Now, don't get me wrong. As a CISO, we do love our peacetime. So how do we reconcile this? How do we reconcile wanting to have peacetime, but also feeling joy from that peacetime? How many of you have read this book, Ikigai, The Japanese Secret to a Long and Happy Life? Maybe watched the Blue Zones documentary in Netflix. Anybody? All right, a little bit more. The Blue Zones documentary showed that Okinawa is one of the places on the planet which has the most centenarians. So these are people living up to 100 or more. And they have this secret. 
which is apparently finding that purpose in your life and doing that thing until the day you die. Definitely not the Western concept of retirement. And it's quite interesting. And what Mark Wynn did was that put that concept of Ikigai in the middle of the Venn diagram of purpose, which was created by Andras Zuzunaga. And then what happened was that Ikigai suddenly became more suitable to our current socioeconomic system. And this is the socioeconomic system that we as CISOs operate in. And by the way, in this presentation, whenever I say CISO, I don't mean only the people who hold the title CISO. If you're the head of security in an organization, if that's your only hat, if you have five hats and that's only one of it, for all intents and purposes of this presentation, you're a CISO. You're wearing the CISO hat. And it's very important for us to understand what is our personal purpose. And this personal purpose statement is actually quite interesting because when we craft it, it sort of becomes a reminder of the things that we love, we're good at, and we like to do. And don't despair if you take a first crack at it and it doesn't look good the first time. Mine is still a work in progress. But at the very least, answer these four questions. What is it that you're good at? And usually I use the litmus test of what are the things that people actually give me feedback on, that they really like what I did with something, whether that's a leadership skill or a technical skill. That's something you're good at. And what do you love? What do you love to do even when nobody pays you for it? And what does that look like? What does that profession look like if somebody actually pays you for it? And finally, if that is something that the world needs, how does that evolve? How does that then look like? And then in the intersection of this comes your personal purpose. Now, I myself, I'm a sucker for growth and improvement. And it sounds great, but sometimes it's not always fun because sometimes it's incurable. But that involves learning new things. That involves helping people as well reach new heights, especially when people don't feel like they still have the weight or the chance to go the next mile, and they manage to get there. I really thrive in that. That really drives me. And metrics as well helps because in a cold, dark night when nobody else believes in what I'm doing and I only have my metrics to show me company, and if they even register a slight improvement, sometimes that's enough to keep me warm and content. And it so happens that this insanity in this socioeconomic context is being valued, so I get to make a living. But does it mean that I love what I'm doing every day? I like everything that I'm doing? Absolutely not. But does it also mean that there are days when there's nowhere else that I'd rather be? Absolutely, yes. And your personal purpose may be enough for you, but if you happen to be working with an organization whose purpose actually aligns with yours, there is immeasurable synergy that sort of just gives so much energy to you when doing something, especially when there's so much noise going around. Which also begs the question, are you working with an organization whose purpose you believe in? Of course, you're a CISO. You're the head of the security function. You need to have your cybersecurity program. And security outcomes is central to that. Now, last year, I presented about the security outcomes canvas in this same unconference. Who among you has heard about it? No, not enough. Please go to our website and check it out. But one good thing about that canvas is that, among, among other things, it will help you find your security outcomes. And in a nutshell, it's really just when you look at the business outcomes that your organization wants to accomplish, you figure out what are the risks to that. Your security outcomes as a CISO should reduce those risks. That's pretty much it. 
and they need to be the centerpiece of your cybersecurity program. And then finally, your resources. Anything and everything that you have access to, you have control over, or you have influence over. So this could be people, this could be your allies, this could be your partners, this could be the technologies that you already have, your budget. These are all the resources that you can actually utilize to make your security outcomes happen. And when these things come together, if you have some understanding of these different elements coming together, then you will see that this is the sphere that, as a CISO, you can operate in. At the intersection of your personal purpose and your organization's purpose, you can find a shared purpose that even in moments when things become challenging and you feel like you have to prove the value of the cybersecurity function, or there's just so much noise, so much opinions going your way that you're not exactly sure what to do, this is a very good energy booster that reminds you why you're doing what you're doing. At the intersection of your organization's purpose and your security outcomes, is typically the place where I drive, I derive energy from, to just continue to do the mission, to continue to secure the, the organization, to elevate security, sometimes even when your tank is running low. Because you know these security outcomes matter for an organization's purpose that you believe in. And at the intersection of your security outcomes and your resources, and this is very important, you'll find the scope and limits of your operations. Because we'll never have enough resources to do everything we need to do in security. Now, I have met the head of security of a very large enterprise organization that has more than 1,800 people under him. That's bigger than with Secure. And he doesn't have enough resources. So the question then becomes, do you at least have enough resources to make a difference in the security outcomes that you're aiming to accomplish? And just maybe, this is also the space where you can find compassion, compassion for yourself, that you can't do everything. There are limits based on the resources that you also have. And you can make a difference, and you can limit your scope, and you can make things happen based on those resources. And then finally, if we are alone and we have our personal purpose, I mean, sure, we have resources at our disposal, but being part of an organization, that power that you have to execute is actually amplified by the resources that the organization also has. And that's quite powerful. And we should not be guilty doing the things that we love to do for the benefit of the organization. For example, if I like metrics, then why not create measurements for how to measure the cybersecurity posture of the organization? Or if you like to investigate, you'd like to follow threat actors, profile them, then carve out time to do it. There is no reason why our jobs shouldn't actually make us happy as well. And maybe by understanding these different aspects, we will find some longevity in our workplace, longevity in the organizations that we belong with, and dare I say, perhaps longevity in our lives as well. Because there's no reason why the guardians of our digital spaces should have the shortest careers or the shortest lives. After all, what is our digital space but composed of the services that we are guarding and growing one organization at a time. Therefore, we need our CISOs, our head of securities, happy, healthy, and energetic about defending our digital space. 
May you find your ikigai. Thank you. I'm not quite done with this stage just yet. So um, the next part of our program will be a panel. So we have some distinguished panelists who will be joining me. And we're going to be talking about balancing minimum effective security mindset with proactive cyber defense. Simon, Stephanie, and Satu, please join me on stage. Warm up. All right, it's quite a long stage. I'll do a Clark Kent and uh, switch to my reading glasses. Welcome. All right, good. So today, we have a few of our panelists here. We have Simon from Germany, who is the VP of IT at the Impreg Group. So if people don't know what the Impreg Group is, this is the world market leader in rehabilitating pipes without replacing them. You don't need to dig them up and replace them. So he probably makes my pipe renovation bills cheaper. And um, he is, he has been in IT for more than three decades, two of that professionally. And he is an analytical and risk-based IT leader who is quite open to new technologies. And a uh, fun fact, he has a Doberman Dober, dober woman, perhaps, <laughs> who is, he is inseparable with. So the mere fact that he's here with us today, we should be grateful that um, he came over and be a bit separated with her. Welcome, Simon. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thanks. We also have Stephanie from the US, who is the chief operating officer of ODIX, an organization who offers hardened security capabilities even suitable for critical infrastructure and which is also her expertise, by the way, critical infra. And she has seen the world evolve for the past four decades. So she, she knows the time of uh, Fortran and microfiches. Who knows Fortran and microfiches here? Excellent, kindred spirit, Stephanie. <laughs> and um, she brings a holistic aspect to cybersecurity, so um, cultural budgeting, senior management, that's up her alley. Thank you. And she is also an amateur geologist. So if you notice her picking up a rock, don't be surprised. Huh? You have a rock. OK. <laughs> All right. <laughs> welcome, Stephanie. Let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you. And then finally, we have Sato, who is the chief information officer of Uteco. The Finns probably know this organization, this is the biggest unemployment fund in Finland, which has more than half a million members. And to put that into perspective, that's 25% of all wage earners. So she is a pragmatic leader and leads by example. And uh, she has just finished his, her master's degree in uh, cybersecurity supply chains, and she is now on her PhD. So she works during the day, studies during the night. Welcome, Sat. Exactly. All right, let's dive right in. So this minimum effective security mindset, which according to Gartner is about cybersecurity, taking on a minimum effort on inputs without impact to outcomes. So you see my CISO face, of course, I'm naturally very suspicious of this, I mean, really. But somehow after it sinks in, you begin to realize that, yeah, I mean, technically it's possible. More does not really mean more. So um, which begs the question, Stephanie, uh, your organization it works with a lot of companies to supply their IT and security stack. Is this a concept that many companies are ready to embrace? Well, I don't know about you, but how often are you going to give back budget and employees? Most of the time, you've fought for it. You have limited resources. And then coming upon a new decision to give back some of that budget or resources is very difficult. So they want to keep more. Yeah. Or at least if they're embracing the concept of minimum security, uh, effective security, then they're going to basically readjust their budget and put it elsewhere. OK. So they're going to have to come up with some innovative ideas. But they're not going to want to get rid of that. So they, they want to reshuffle it around. <laughs> exactly. Um, Simon, what do you think about this? I mean, is this a concept that's suitable for your organization as well? Uh, yes. Thanks. Um, definitely. 
I think um, might we have to split it up into two parts, balancing minimum and effective security. Right. So as you said already, balancing minimum efforts in half the best effective security, it's the right way where we should go. And each company should be on the stage or should be ready to do that right now because we cannot wait. And we all, as you said, we have limited resources, yep. often limited budgets. So we have to find a way to balance this with the minimum effort to get the best security out of mm -hmm. it. So it could also be reshuffling things around. Now, this minimum effective security mindset, of course, it doesn't mean that you're not being proactive. I, I guess that's, that's the idea. But as said already, we never have enough resources. So um, which sort of like begs the question, Satu, from your perspective, how can organizations be proactive in their security measures when, well, you can never have enough resources? I, I would like to say so that it's most important that company understand the level of the cyber security mm. and data security and ensure that the leaders and board members all understand that level because they are responsible that, for that and they give the resources. And after that, just to prioritize. It should be, it can be technical issues, it can be administrative issues. And one thing, what is sometimes maybe a little unestimated and unvalued is the training, the power of the training. Because we all know that the stuff, uh, people can be the weakest point or they can be also the strongest point. Mm. So that's something that we should keep in mind. Uh, I'd like to pull a bit the thread on leadership and maybe go back to Stephanie a bit on this because it has been mentioned so many times already about the support that you get from senior management. We see something that really makes a world of difference. Um, in the companies that you have work at, worked with, uh, how has been the shift when it comes to the sentiment of senior management in cybersecurity? Well, I don't know about you guys, but it usually follows with We've got the budget, we have a great marketing campaign, and it's the culture. Okay. But when something goes wrong, suddenly that same management group is almost pointing fingers. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think it's ride with the good tide. Um, but, you know, I think it's also, as Satu said, it's training. We have to train not only those who work for us, but management as well to understand. Absolutely. Yes. Okay? And the training shouldn't just be about how do you secure, but no. Sort of how do you secure a whole organization and what it takes? Exactly, and it's, it's a cultural thing, right? You guys find that? Yeah. All right, fascinating. So um, I'm curious as well about, well, going to Simon now, megatrends. We have heard about LLM models and we have heard about AI and all of these different facets. Do you think there are other megatrends? I mean, you're from Germany. Are there different megatrends in that place that you see that could? I mean, yes, definitely. We, the last two decades, we have uh, tons of megatrends. Yes, we have IoT starting with mobile devices, and and each megatrend uh, getting in combined together. So now we have AI and all the other megatrends from the past, social media, IoT, etc., is combined in together. Mm. And if we analyze it, it's like all ends by the human. So all megatrends is linked to humans at the end. So the next megatrend will be definitely a new megatrend who is combining all the megatrends and combine AI and generate something. Um, but we have to be on top on first, and we have to ensure that we clearly monitor these megatrends and find a way to train our humans, to coach our humans, to out coach our employees in a company state to get them on top how to use the megatrends. Mm. It's always the same. It's a, a megatrend can be good and can be bad. Is it fair to say that um, irrespective of whatever the megatrend is, yeah. if, I mean, humans are always the center of these megatrends anyway, and therefore, like, all of this training um, that all of you are alluding to, it's really about making the human understand exactly. where, where is their place in that megatrend. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, you are on, on the point. So it's... I would add to that. What do you think? As soon as we are finished training on the most recent you know, implementation, okay. sure. then 
should we take on that minimum effective mm. mindset? Mm. What about the introduction of new technology in cyber that is available for us in the cybersecurity area? So not only do we have to take on something that is already there and reassess it and make that a project to see what do we have, what do we need, but we also have to embrace looking at bringing in something new constantly. Yeah. It can't just sit on the shelf. But uh, that's all sort of very interesting because you're really talking about no cybersecurity. There's no one size fits all mm -hmm. with yeah. different organizations. You have to tailor it to what works for them. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you have to tailor your management to understand that as well. And it's training mm -hmm. or retraining because we're introducing new packages constantly. So it's a mindset, again, cultural, understanding that this will change. It's not just learn once and sit it on the shelf. We were talking quite a bit about trainings um, in this discussion today, and I, I fully agree as a CISO. So if, um, for example, if my budgets are truly really limited severely and there's nothing else I can invest mm -hmm. on, should I just invest in training? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, if we're taking on that limited mindset, you've got to have a project, you have to constantly reevaluate re what you have. Yeah. And then, you know, maybe it's a swap, right? You take out something that you really don't need anymore. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're no longer using USB drives, uh, exactly. what else do we need to in place? So the, the flexibility as well to Absolutely. discard things that you may not need anymore mm -hmm. and then change it when new technologies comes in. Um, Stephanie, like from the US and critical infrastructure, talking about megatrends as well, is there anything else that you actually see happening? Over the last couple of years, they've been adding on. It's the opposite of minimum effective security. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, personnel, I keep trying to explain to you, if you were in IT over the years, it doesn't mean you're a cyber security person mm. or that you even want to do it or that you have the training to do it. Yeah. So I think there's a reevaluation re in that area for skill sets in human resources as well. All right. So human resource evaluation as well. Mm -hmm. um, Satu, related to megatrends, and of course you, you have written your master's thesis on supply chains as well. Mm. Is there anything you'd want to explain, discuss with us regarding your findings in that area? Um, as I think we all have read, read from the research papers that the supply chain risks are increasing. So that's something what we are doing this year and next couple of years because we are not serving the, uh, our customers all alone. We have a lot of partners, a lot of cooperation uh, companies. And that's something which I found that the leaders support and the culture that where the cybersecurity is important. Mm. And the, how to say, the discussion is the, con it goes continuously. It, it's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So that was one of my findings. All right. And um, well, as I see, so I mean, third party, the third parties that you have, they are quite challenging to sort of track, not because of them, but sort of there are fourth parties as well. Yeah. And kind of like the, this becomes really yeah. exponential. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, like, do, do you think organizations have cracked this, Stephanie? Or like, what, what, what are they trying to do to sort of like manage this? I've attempted to consult, but have those conversations with your contractors or your third or fourth parties. You know, make sure they understand what you want to have in place. Mm. But it does, the message doesn't always get you know, sent down the line, does it? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. That's true. There is a lot of legislation and regulation concerning that, but it's daily work, what mm -hmm. you have to do with the partners. Mm -hmm. So that's important. Definitely. Do you have the same or different sentiment on this own? Definitely. And it's also to be on us, on companies himself, to, to look in our partners and convince them to, to invest in, in security yeah. Yeah. and to follow the rules. And we can all be only better in cybersecurity when we work all together. We are on the same boat. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these partners that we have, the world has changed so much that our data, it's no longer in our perimeter, right? Mm. We, we gave it to them. And then we trust them to take care of that. So uh, don't trust. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need to validate yeah. if they can trust. really take yeah, care right. of it. Yes, trust absolutely. But, trust and validate, yeah.
Indeed. So um, shifting over the gears to outcome-based security. So I'm, I'm a big fan of outcome-based security. So um, I just mentioned earlier as well where security outcomes is really the result of reducing the risks to the business outcomes. This is how we should define our cybersecurity strategy because, of course, the cybersecurity function doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists to defend the organization. And this goes back again to the question of resources. So my question to each of you, and perhaps let's start with Satu. Uh, do you think, do you have any tips on how can organizations do outcome-based security with, once again, limited resources? I think one point could be that you, how to say, integrate the risk management and cybersecurity risk and data risk to, together. Mm. And you have this, how to say, continuously discussion with the leaders that what does it mean to the, to the business if something happens? So it's just very concretical things. All right. Anything to add, Simon? I totally agree. I would add that we have to shift our mindset from back in the days, OK, we do an asset, and then we change things, and then we let, we let it go. So we have to re-asset. We have to review. It's, it should be a, like a circle, asset or, or check what is, uh, what is needed to do, do the security features, and then recheck. Are we on the same base? How is the impact from outside? Mm. Does it change new technologies? and then do the next step. So it's, but it, it's sort of really interesting that you mentioned that because, I mean, it has been also mentioned that as, with cybersecurity, there's no finish line. No. No. Mm, you, that's true. It's sort of like a circle. I mean, something new comes in, you do the same thing, rinse, repeat. Um, Stephanie, is this something you also see in other organizations? Yeah, when Sato, you're mentioning about each person having their responsibility, mm -hmm. I like to tell companies, Everyone, uh, everyone is responsible for security. Absolutely. And remember, we've got the physical aspect as well. Yes. And you know, if you leave the server run door open and, and everyone's mm -hmm. accessing it, it's not helpful. But so, if everyone has the mindset and the culture, it's not just oh, I don't know, that's the cybersecurity department. Or the, yeah, yeah. It's not the IT group. It's everyone is responsible, mm -hmm. and it ties into accountability and culture. That's a good point. It's fascinating that you mentioned that because, like, you can't really separate physical and digital anymore. They no. are they are blended. Mm -hmm. um, we have our last question before we conclude, and um, I'm curious, what do you think about exposure management? So um, we have it here today, launching as well exposure management product, launching the capability that, which also supports this minimum effective mindset that essentially you can prioritize which are the things that you need to address first, which are the vulnerabilities that could be easily exploited. Mm -hmm. um, how well do you think exposure management would work with proactive defense, and will organizations be ready to embrace this? Let's start with Simon, perhaps. Yes, uh, it's a great tool. So exposure management um, can help us to elevate our security a lot because we can prioritize it easier. We can combine this uh, tool with all the databases, and we get mm -hmm. more insights. So we see what it affects at the end. So that's really important to address and to, to negotiate which one I will address first. Mm. That's mm. really important. Yeah. It's almost like outsourcing a skill set. Yeah. As I was yeah. saying earlier, the first step we need to do is create a project. Well, now we don't have to with this type of tool. It does it for you. It's like, you know, outsourcing that whole skill set to minimize the exposure. Yes. Yeah, that's so awesome. You, I think that's great. That actually helps remove the friction as well. If yes. You can outsource it. You, you can always point to the tool. Yes, exactly. Tool like, who are you going to blame? The tool said that. Tool said we don't need that anymore. Or you. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Sato, do you have anything else Nothing to add? Nothing to add. I fully agree. <laughs> fully agree with yeah. you. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm curious as well if our audience would have any questions. Um, there should be microphones running around, hopefully with a person on running. it. Otherwise, that would be scary. <laughs> Artificial ones. If anybody <laughs> has any questions to our distinguished panel, this is your opportunity. I know this is Finland, but you don't have to be shy. Come on, bring it on. <laughs> <laughs>
must be so clear everything. <laughs> Seems to be a very shy crowd. I'll give you a few more seconds. <coughs> Going once, twice, maybe they understood everything. All right. Well, if there are no questions, I would like to thank Simon, Stephanie, and Satu for joining thank us you. today and for giving us your insights and expertise. Um, it has been lovely to have you in this panel. And uh, thank you as well to our audience for listening. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Marcus. Yeah.